I like to think that I make some pretty interesting stuff on this channel, but there's also a lot of interesting stuff that I make that doesn't end up on the channel. So I think I'm going to mix it up today. Before we get into this, I think I need to give a little backstory on how I got here. A few years ago, my family was getting serious about skiing, and as a maker, I started looking into how to make skis. It turned out I pretty much had everything I needed to vacuum bag a set of skis, and a lot of the materials too, so I asked a friend of mine how bad of an idea that would be. I was hoping he would talk me out of it, but he said, that's something I always wanted to do! And so we made a set of skis. They were hanging over the door in my shop, and they were pretty terrible. But we made another set that was a little less terrible, and the third set was actually kind of good. And after that, we built a ski press and kept at it, and eventually ran out of ways of making bad skis and started making ones that were pretty good. Since we were set up to do custom skis of any shape and size, as part of this journey, we decided it would be kind of funny to do an old-school mono ski. Since most people aren't familiar with mono skis, I think this is a good opportunity to explain what it is and give some history. It's pretty much the same as two skis, but just stuck together. Unlike a snowboard, the bindings both face forward, and it actually predates snowboarding. It started out, depending on who you ask, sometime in the 60s or 70s, and peaked in popularity in the 70s and 80s. And then snowboarding came along and mono skiing became sort of an evolutionary dead end. But even though we made the first one of these is it sort of a joke, it turns out I really like doing this. It's kooky and weird and you can rip the shit out of it and it's pretty much just my style. But there's a couple problems with mono skiing and that's how we got here. Normal ski bindings are just screwed into the core of the ski with basically some glorified wood screws. Which is fine for a single ski because when you put lateral pressure on it, the ski rolls over on edge. But if you put two bindings on the same ski, you end up in a situation where you can theoretically roll the bindings in opposite directions at the same time. The result is those wood screws pull out of the ski core. And so when I built my second mono ski, I built in some snowboard binding inserts. They're these little threaded hexagonal inserts that mount from the bottom. It's a lot stronger attachment, and so that solved the problem of pulling the bindings off the board. But then I started breaking bindings instead, like this one. and this one. And yeah, I know it's a demo binding and it's not the most rigid thing, but most modern ski bindings are made with so much plastic and they're just not designed for that lateral force. The two solutions to this problem are to either scrounge up some old metal race bindings or go to a binding that's designed specifically for mono skis. But since we're talking about the duckbill platypus of snow sports, pretty much the only option for mono ski bindings is these made by the French mono ski company, Snow Guns. Now if you're a skier and you're thinking I'm going to destroy my knees by using a non-releasable binding, Go ahead and just stand in that mono ski position with your feet next to each other and see how much you can twist your knees. It's almost none. Because you can't twist your knees independently, mono skis are actually safer for your knees. And the worst thing you can do is have one foot release. So let's make a mono ski to put these on. I'm going to start out with the base because that's what sets the shape of the ski. The base material is ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. It comes sanded and flame treated for bonding on one side. This stuff is the industry standard for a ski base. The vacuum box on my CNC router is made out of MDF and just powered by a small shop vac. It works really well for holding down material like this. I'm using a left-hand spiral or down-cutting bit for all of the operations I'll show here. It still spins right, but since the flutes spiral the opposite way, it pushes the material down into the table instead of lifting it up, so it works really well for thin material. But it doesn't clear chips as well as a normal up-cutting bit. I find that cutting almost, but not entirely the whole way through, helps maintain the vacuum hold down and can easily be cleaned up with a knife afterwards. The next step is one of the more tedious parts of the process, bending the edges. I'm doing a full wrap edge, but doing it in four pieces, tip, tail, and two sides it makes it a lot simpler. This little homemade bender is made out of a cheap drill press vise. It's a pretty slick base if you need to make a light-duty ring roller. It's really just a process of bend a little, check it, bend some more, recheck, and keep tweaking. I'm making the final fine adjustments with a modified set of nippers. They're ground down to either bend or straighten the edges needed depending on which way you hold it. Once the edge fits tightly, a few drops of super glue tack it in place temporarily. The base material is still pretty floppy at this point, so I found it works best to clamp it down to a template to keep it from warping while doing the side edges. 
The edges on the sides don't need to get bent at all, just cut to length. And once the glue dries, the base and edges are pretty much done. I'm using a combination of poplar and maple for the core on this. I glued up this blank a few years ago, but since you probably know how glue and clamps work, I don't feel bad about skipping over that part. This is a little too wide for my planer, so the first step is going to be to surface this on the CNC. I was trying to take the minimum off to get this to clean up, which meant I ended up having to do two passes. And once it's flat, the core gets a groove cut in it for the sidewall and pockets for the bearing inserts. For the sidewalls, I'm using Smooth-On's PMC 790. It's a 90A shore hardness urethane, and gets a little black pigment mixed in it. The first batch wasn't quite enough, so I mixed up some with some white pigment in it. Give it a nice little two-tone effect. That obviously makes a big mess, but since I haven't moved it, I can just do another surfacing pass to clean up the bottom of the core. For profiling the core, I wrote a parameterized G-code program. I just have to put in the length, width, and thickness of the core, and the machine does the rest. I've got the core flipped over back on the vacuum fixture. The tape along the sides is to help seal it up. I found that climb milling these helps minimize tear out along the edges. And since branding is obviously super critical, even if we never actually sell any skis, I'm going to print a logo on the top sheet with some thickened pigmented epoxy. The ski gets laid up between some aluminum sheets, but before that the sheet gets some mold release on it. And then some spray glue to tack the base down in place. and some wood blocks get hot glued on to align the core to the base. And then it's finally time for some epoxy. I'm using just a normal laminating epoxy, nothing special here. The first thing to go down is some thin rubber strips over the edges. These help bond the edges by absorbing any interlaminar shear. The first composite layer is a layer of unidirectional carbon. This will give the board longitudinal stiffness. I'm using a lot of little strips here because we got a good deal on scraps from a local carbon supplier. Next layer is a layer of biaxial carbon. The fibers on this will run diagonally across the board and give it a lot of torsional stiffness, keep it from twisting. This is a 24 ounce fabric. It's pretty heavy and drinks up a lot of epoxy. So I'm being pretty generous here, but any extra will get pressed out. And then it's another layer of carbon uni, either because I want this thing to be really stiff, or I got confused on my layup schedules between other builds we've done. Next up is the core. And then some more epoxy. and then a layer of 20 ounce triaxial fiberglass. The area over the bindings gets one more layer of fiberglass just as an extra reinforcement. And then the top sheet. I think these are nylon top sheets. I really don't remember. Once that's in place, the final aluminum skin gets put on the top. The corners of the aluminum sheets are zip-tied together, and it's ready to go in the press.
Naturally, my ski press is made out of some rusty I-beams we pulled out of the edge of a field. We originally had smaller fire hose for the bladders, but someone in one of the snowboard building groups on Facebook was giving these away, so pick those up. The molds that set the rocker and camber on the skis are made out of MDF and whatever plywood I have laying around, just CNC'd to shape. The top mold here can adjust in and out, have some spacers here, and just some recovered roller blade wheels for that. I've got about 55 PSI in the bladders right now, but over this much area, that's a hell of a lot of force. So we have some deflection bars here that we put in after we load it. These are grade seven threaded rod, so they're pretty strong. This thing likes to accumulate junk, but it's also where I have my arbor press mounted because I like to press things, so I put a press on my press so I can press things while I'm pressing things. Well, it was one quick fade to black for you, but I left this thing in the press for a few days. I used an epoxy with a pretty slow hardener, and since I do pretty low volume of these things, I don't have any heater blankets in the press. But I'll get this thing unpacked, which is a process that I find, frankly, rather depressing. Putting a layer of masking tape over this just to keep the top sheet from getting scratched up while I'm trimming it. The first rough trim gets done on the bandsaw, and I have to admit this is my least favorite part of the process. I think anyone who's done work with fiberglass and carbon fiber understands what I mean. After the rough trim, I do a very rough bevel of the sidewall with my table router. For doing the bevel, I use a bearing bit and an angled wood block screwed to the router table. Now I only have a little bit of epoxy left right along the edge, and I just use an oscillating spindle sander to remove that. Then it's back to the router to very carefully do the final bevel on the sidewall. I've got to be honest, this part scares me more than probably anything else I do in the shop. The finishing touch is to just slightly round over the top edge with some sandpaper. The binding inserts do have little plastic caps on them to keep them from filling with epoxy, but I find running a tap down there to be a good idea anyway. There's a mark on the boot for the boot center, and I know from previous mounts I want that 79 centimeters from the tail. Well, I'm pretty stoked with how that came out. All I've got to do now is take it to the ski shop and get it tuned, and then wait for enough snow for the ski areas to open. Did I actually finish a project ahead of schedule? It's sort of like us, you know, spring, people 